what what is contained in those chapters basically is a look at what we talk about as the sources of the Pentateuch, the JEDP theory, Van Julius Vanhausen theory, these, these scripture scholars are all Germans, and so you get all sorts of German stuff going on. Uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which are called prehistory, the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which is the rest of Genesis, which is the period of the patriarchs, the Exodus, which would be the period of Moses, the desert wandering, which is the period involved in Numbers, uh, the rest of uh, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then the conquest. So it basically moves from the first establishment of the Promised Land through to the migration to Egypt, the Exodus or the freedom from Egypt to Mount Sinai, where the nation is formed, then a wandering period of 40 years, and then the reconquering of the land and the division of the land among the tribes. That's basically the material that we look at today. Now, notice I said the first migration into the land and the reconquering of the land. The land. That is a very, very significant theme, and in fact, the top question that you'll see, which is the last question I entered into, is to discuss the from the readings and from the material that you have um, looked at, to discuss the significance of the land. And I, tri I tripped up both questions a little bit, both in the period that you read about in the New Testament, and from what you're hearing in the news and everything else today. Because the land is also a very, very significant thing today. And whose land, et cetera. We'll talk about a little bit about that in a, in a few minutes. But, you know, that's, when you open up the discussion questions, that's the top question. So it might get some interesting uh, discussion. Okay. All right, now I knew you were going to do that. Oh, there we go. Okay, the divisions then of the Old Testament. So let's, let's look at what we're dividing in terms of things. So the Old Testament primarily is divided into three parts. The first part is the law, the Torah. That's what, that's what those funny looking little squiggles there are. Uh, when we had it on the other computer, they were even funnier with these squiggles. They made no sense. But the Torah, or the law, also known as the Pentateuch, Penta five, two plus scrolls, five scrolls. And so the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Uh, very, very significant, very, very sacred. To a Jew, the Torah would be not equivalent to, but held in somewhat the same liturgical honor that we hold the Gospels. And so in a liturgical celebration for Judaism, there is a Torah reading. There is a Hath Torah reading. Is that the first two and a half books? <laughs> Basically, that's the book. The Hath Torah would be the prophets. And then a homily preached. We took that and basically have now a reading from the letters and a reading from the gospel. The gospel reading is done by an ordained minister. The Torah reading is done by a rabbi. The epistle reading is done by a lay person. The Haftorah reading is done by a non-rabbi who is somewhat educated, etc. See, so that, that Jewish liturgical celebration with the Torah reading and the Haftorah reading becomes the base of our liturgy of the word. It's the synagogue service. And as I say to people, and more will come up when we get to the uh, Passover, that our liturgy is a synagogue service joined to a Passover meal. Okay, so that's the Torah. The second division is the Nevi'im. Nevi is a prophet. So the Nevi'im would be the prophets. And again, when we get to that next week, it's not a prophet who foretells the future. It's a prophet who speaks, say me, in place of God, pro. 
So the prophet basically speaks in place of God. And so maybe a revolutionary notion is that when we talk about the Old Testament prophets, they're not there to foretell the future. They're there to communicate God's will to the present. That's what they're all about. Somehow or other, in later, in that fourth period, that period we'll talk about the last session, prophecy ended up being looking at the future. And we'll talk about why that happened and what happened there overall. But the prophet is one who speaks to the present, the will of God. And the prophets are subdivided into the former and the latter prophets. Let me just quickly mention in that division, the latter prophets are what you would call a prophet. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Nahum, Daniel, uh, Obadiah, Zephaniah, you know, those, those, what we call, I'm sorry, if I'm in the way, uh, what we call the uh, prophets would be the latter prophets. The former prophets are more or less what we would call the historical books. So the history of the period that the latter prophets write in. Then the third section is known as the Ketuvim, or the writings. Ketab in Hebrew means to write. So Ketub would be a writing. And so the writings are everything else that's left. So the poetic books, the Psalms, the books of Proverbs, the books of Ecclesiastes, the wisdom texts, all of those things, if it's not Torah and it's not prophets, former or latter, then it's included in the writings. And because of this Torah, Nevi'im and Ketuvim, Jewish people will refer to their scriptures, or what we call the Old Testament, as Tanakh. From T N K. So if you ever hear the term Tanakh, it refers to the Old Testament. Now, just a sideline. I may use back and forth, but since we are all Catholic and Christian, etc., uh, we can speak about Old Testament. But in interreligious dialogue with Jews and to a certain degree with Muslims, people, they get very upset at us talking about their scriptures as Jewish, particularly as the Old Testament. Because to them, there's only one testament. And so, and our scriptures being the New Testament. And so, in ecumenical circumstances and interreligious dialogue circumstances, we many times will speak of what we call the Old Testament as the Hebrew scriptures. Because they were originally written in Hebrew. And our scriptures would then be called the Greek scriptures. Because they were originally written in Greek rather than Hebrew, uh, Hebrew scriptures and Greek scriptures rather than Jewish and Christian even, as far as things are concerned. But we accept as scripture their scriptures overall. Okay. Now, we talked a little bit about the Torah. Let's get a little more example. So the former prophets then, as I said, are the historical books, which would be Joshua, Judges, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, and 2 Kings. The uh, historical books from Joshua through two kings will basically talk about the history of Israel from the conquest in Joshua through to the fall of the southern kingdom at the time of the exile. So from about 1200, a little later than 1200 BCE, all the way through to 587. That's, that's the material that's covered in Joshua to two kings. The latter prophets would be, as I said, the prophets that we know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, etc. And these prophets fit into this history. So, for instance, Isaiah basically would fit into sections of one and two kings. And there's references to Isaiah in there. And so history that's recorded here would also be spoken of here. Jeremiah would fit into two kings. Jeremiah is just at the time of the fall, around 587. And so two kings is narrating that. And various of the twelve. When I talk about the book of the twelve, you know, that's a kind of an interesting comment. 
we divide our scroll, we divide our books by scrolls, by how much will fit on a piece of parchment, how much will fit on a scroll. And obviously, like what was called the book of Samuel is not going to fit on one scroll. So one scroll is one Samuel, and the other scroll is two Samuel. Well, the opposite occurs here. We got a lot of prophets, and they don't fill up a scroll. In fact, twelve of them fill up a scroll. And so it's called the Book of the Twelve. And if you look at, you know, Nahum and Obadiah and Zephaniah and Micah and Hosea, yeah, they're not the, they're not the size of an Isaiah or a Jeremiah. Altogether, they are. And that's why the Twelve are in one scroll, and it's known as the Book of the Twelve. The Twelve Minor Prophets, also. You could, I doubt if they'd like to be called Minor Prophets, but uh, <laughs> that's what scholars have called them. Now, uh, oh, let me go back a second. I might as well make, make mention here, too. There are a couple of books here that are not listed. And they actually would fit into the former prophets, etc. Uh, there's the first book of Chronicles, and the second book of Chronicles, and the book of Ezra, and the book of Nehemiah. Now, the first and second book of Chronicles deal with the same historical period as this. Ezra and Nehemiah deal with the period after the exile, the post-exilic period. And so one Chronicles goes from the founding of the monarchy to the post-exilic period. Why is that, why is that important? Now, for those of you who haven't read yet, this may be a little bit difficult, but uh, I'll try to make it as simple as possible. With the sources of the Pentateuch, we talk about JEDP, the Deuteronomic source, okay? It goes on. The Deuteronomic source is found in the book of Deuteronomy primarily, and uh, it goes on into this history. This is also known as the Deuteronomic history because it's written by the same author that basically wrote the Deuteronomic source. The priestly source continues on in the Chronicler's history. And so 1, 2 Chronicles and Ezra and Nehemiah are coming from the same source as the priestly writer of the Pentateuch. Uh, for those of you who this is sort of like looking like what's going on here, bear with us a few seconds and we'll get into the, the sources. But this is De Deuteronomic. So the Deuteron Deuteronomistic history and the Chronicler's history. So D and P. I have to tell you this because we were kidding about it at the rectory. Uh, Thursday night the pastor wanted to clean out the refrigerator and uh, you know we'd have everything uh, for dinner. I'm not using the word at this point. And I said, oh good, we'll cook paralepomena then. And he looked at me and he said, well, paralepomai means to leave behind or leave over. So paralepomena are leftovers. <laughs> we're having that for dinner. Oh, okay, wonderful. If you look at an older Catholic Bible, you will not find the first book of Chronicles or the second book of Chronicles. You will find the first book of Paralipomenon. The first book of Leftovers. <laughs> and so what, what is it? It's the material that didn't fit in here that was left over. It got written here. <laughs> So uh, then our pastor went down and started telling the GRE about this wonderful meal of paralipomena. I said, yes, paralipomena or gratin. <laughs> so, so anyway, uh, I, I had to throw that little thing in. But the Deuteronomic history and the Chronicler's history, D and P. Now the writings are Psalms, Proverbs, Job, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, everything else just left. Esther... <laughs> Daniel, not necessarily the whole of Daniel, but sections of Daniel. Daniel is a very interesting book. Daniel was written in approximately, it was written uh, toward the end of the Old Testament period, and it's written in three languages. Most of these books were written in Hebrew. Daniel's written, Daniel's written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. And uh, for very sundry reasons, it appears that way. And then here's Ezra Nehemiah and the Chronicler's history that gets kind of caught into the writings also. But these would also be historical books. Uh, Proverbs, Job, uh, Kohelet are wisdom books. 
Wisdom is the art of living rightly, the art of living correctly overall. Uh, Kohelet is probably, if you, if you feel in a very depressed mood someday, don't read Kohelet. <laughs> Habal Havalim Kol Haval Ein Makash Mitakat Hashemish. Translation? <laughs> vanity of vanities, all is vanity, there is nothing new under the sun. That's the way Kohelet begins. So you start reading that and you just going to get more depressed. <laughs> Psalms, of course, I think you're very familiar with what they are. They are they're actually the polyhymnal of the Temple of Jerusalem. You know, it's all hymns that are sung. Uh, Lamentations is the end of the book of Jeremiah, which talks about the city of Jerusalem after it's been destroyed. So, that then would basically be the division. Any, any questions or observations? Yes? I have a question. That's because I that's, that's what's coming here. Oh, okay. That's where I'm going right now. Is that just interpretation? Is it writing? Is it different times? It's different times. It's different times, yeah. Yes, Eloise. Yeah. Okay, that's what I. That's where I'm going. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll help you. That's where I'm going. So let's hold that question. Anything on where I've been? Okay. Well, then, since there's nothing on where I've been, let's go where I'm going. So now let's look at this J. So this will get everybody up to up to uh, snuff. Hexatuch. Oh my goodness. Well, you know what Pentateuch is, right? Hex in Greek is six. And so Hexatuch is six scrolls. It's basically take the Pentateuch and add Joshua, is what happens. So the six scrolls, since the time of Julius Wellhausen in the middle of the 19th century, thought the Hexateuch, the six scrolls were thought to be the work of four different sources, that there are four different sources that work in the context of the, of the, 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 the Bible. Now, the first one is the Yahwist, or J. But, Father, we spell Yahweh with a Y. Ja, aber die Deutsche do nicht buchstabieren das weg. The Germans, my German's not that great. The Germans don't spell it that way, they spell it with a J. And so, consequently, we get a J. Actually, I should do my little exercise and then do this, but uh, maybe we'll do this and then my little exercise. Uh, the J source primarily dates from the 10th century. Ideally, it dates from around the kingdom of David and Solomon. And it is located in the southern kingdom, in the area of Judah, around Jerusalem. And so, the J source is probably the oldest of the four sources. And it comes from a rather prosperous, educated, well-organized, big kingdom. Okay? The Eloist source comes two centuries later. The 8th century. And again, it comes from around the kingdom of, I think it would come from the kingdom of Amri. Again, a fairly uh, wealthy and prosperous region, but it's from the northern kingdom. Now, I'm, I'm depending upon your knowledge of Old Testament intro that when we say northern kingdom and Judah and things of that, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if not, holler. But <coughs> basically, that's where the E source comes from. Why is the Yahweh called Yahweh? Because when God is referred to, the reference is always the Tetragrammaton Yahweh. Why is the Eloist called Eloist? Because when God is referred to, it's always the term Elohim, which is another term for God. So at certain points, we see God referred to as Yahweh, and then a sentence later, he's referred to, or God's referred to as Elohim. And this is consistent. And so that led Wellhausen to start separating out these various sources. The third source is the Deuteronomist. 
it comes from the seventh century, basically uh, written in the northern kingdom. When the northern kingdom was destroyed, it was brought to the southern kingdom, and you know the northern kingdom was destroyed in 722. It was brought to the southern kingdom and hidden in the temple until Hezekiah began to refurbish the temple and it was found. Hence it's called Deutero Second Namos Law. So we have the law, but now all of a sudden this scroll that's been hidden for a few hundred years is found which re reinforces the law, but it's the second time it's been found, and so it's called Deuteronomy by, by scholars, not by the... Obviously, Deuteros Nomos is Greek, and so a Jewish scholar in the 7th century isn't going to call it by a Greek name. But scholars call it by that. And the, Deuter the Deuteronomist, the basic thing that was going on at the time of Hezekiah and shortly thereafter was a sense, and this is where the covenants come in and everything else, that God will always be with us. No matter what happens, God will not abandon us. God will not forsake us. We can do anything. Hmm, that sounds familiar. We can do anything. God loves us. Okay. The Deuteronomic Code basically says, no, you have to follow the will of God, or God will punish you. And the Deuteronomic Code clashes with this idea of the people that God will always love us, we can do anything. And basically the clash becomes very, very significant in that when the Babylonians are coming down, this is making a long story short, when the Babylonians are coming down, the Jewish people are saying, hey, God will protect us, we don't have to worry about anything, we can have all these other gods and whatnot and wherefores, and he won't destroy us, he won't destroy our city, he won't destroy our temple. And Jeremiah, in his Deuteronomic Code, because Jeremiah pushes the Deuteronomic Code, says, follow the laws of God or the Babylonians will get you. Oh, no, they won't. Oh, yes, they did. The city was destroyed in 587. Now, we'll go into that in more detail in a couple of weeks, but the Deuteronomist was right, basically. The Deuteronomist was right. And the Deuteronomist basically imposes, again, the covenant with Moses. You see, that this is where, that what actually, to use the language of the course that I'm using, the God will protect us is coming out of the covenant with David. The Deuteronomist is, is working out of the covenant with Moses. And the Davidic covenant and the Mosaic covenant are fighting with each other. Okay? So the Deuteronomist basically wins here. And basically, the Deuteronomistic history, that, that history of Joshua Judges, etc., says, you know, okay, the people sin, God punishes, they cry out, God sends salvation, they say great, they sin, they cry out, and it's a cycle. That, so the Deuteronomist says, you say you're going to suffer for it. Okay? Now, just for coming attractions, Later on, this becomes very, very important. Later on, there's a period right before the New Testament. So we'll talk about this in session six. There's a period where all of a sudden the people start obeying, you know, the people are obeying the law. They follow the Sabbath, they have circumcision, they have the Torah readings, they have all of these things. But they're under a Greek king who doesn't like that. And so he starts martyring them. We had the reading a couple of weeks ago about the, the Mattathias and his sons and the, you know, the one who wanted to offer the incense and he slapped his head off and everything else. They were doing what the law demands. And uh, they get killed for it. And now there's all of a sudden, wait, wait a minute, this is, God says do what the law demands. That's Deuteronomic. We're doing what the law demands. Why are we dying? And I'll explain more of this later. I say this is the coming attraction. The answer becomes, well, maybe this life isn't all there is. 
It's out of that experience that the notion of resurrection comes about. So maybe let that king kill you because there's a life after this life and you will rise again. See, resurrection is a very late Jewish concept. The New Testament, we think, oh, it's been around all the time. But it comes from applying Deuteronomic theology to a situation where the exact opposite occurs. Follow the law and you die. That can't be. Okay. See my coming attractions? P. The priestly source. Okay, basically, uh, because it comes out of the priestly origin. Now, again, if you recall your history, after the exile, the monarchy never returned. Where did power go? Power went to the priests. And so, notice, after the exile is where the priestly source comes from. And so it's a source that comes from the power after the monarchy, and it's basically 5th century. Now, I forgot to give you characteristics of the Deuteronomic. The Deuteronomic uh, source basically talks about following the laws, the commands, the ordinances of the Lord, which were given, and so on. If you hear laws, commands, ordinances, etc., you're more than likely dealing with Deuteronomic source. The priestly source is very precise. In the first year, on the fourth day, in the, you know, that's priestly, basically. Okay, now let me do my little uh, exercise. If you will open your Bibles to Genesis 1. What a logical place to start an Old Testament course. I keep going this long, I don't know how long we're, how far we're going to get. <laughs> Notice it says, I hope it says, for your first story of creation. Okay. Now if we move to Genesis 2, down around verse 4, it's a second story of creation. Notice what Genesis 2 starts at the time. This is 2-4. At the time when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Okay, that's fine. While as yet there was no field shrub on earth, no grass of the field had sprouted, for the Lord God had sent no rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the soil. Whoa, wait a minute. I thought up here in Genesis 1 we had field shrubs and we made man, and you know, we had man and woman and all this stuff. Where did they go? Okay, this is one of the problems that led people like Bellhausen to say, well, there's obviously different sources at work here. That's where the division into sources, because there's, as you're reading, you know, well, wait a minute, I've heard this before. And then you start looking at that more carefully, and you start subdividing, and then Bellhausen noticed that, well, okay, when God's name is used here, it's Yahweh. But when it's used here, it's Elohim. That's, that's how the, the process came about. That's where it came from. Now, what I'll tell you, and it's, it's, it's just fairly simple, the second story of creation, which is much more graphic and much more narrative, etc., is J. And so the, the story of the rib and Eve coming from Adam and all that is J. Chapter 3 of Genesis, the story of the fall, is J. And so the, the name of Yahweh is standard, etc. The first chapter, which is very, very precise, day, you know, and God said, and there was, it was good, day one. And God said, it was, and it was, it was good, day two. Very precise, very straightforward. What do you think it is? Priestly. One, chapter one is the priestly account. And again, what is the highlight of chapter one? The day that God rested. Which of course is the day that the priest works. 
And so your, your Sabbath is what's significant in there. And that is a priestly, yeah. So, you know, so it's, little, it's little things like that that you can begin to see uh, as it develops. So that, that just gives you a, a little bit of sense of what's going on. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Ten Commandments that we find in Exodus, I think are Elohist. I could be wrong, but I think they're Elohist, Exodus 20. The Ten Commandments are also in Deuteronomy, in Deuteronomy 6. No, Deuteronomy 5, and that's the D source. So you have an E source and a D source for the Ten Commandments. See, there, I don't know if you realize, they're in the Pentateuch twice. And so one source is the E, the other source would be the D. And things that appear in double sources and things like that, that, that's how the process came about. Okay, now let's go forward a little further in this. So then the formation of the tradition. Obviously, if the J source is from the 10th century and the E source is from the 8th century and the D source is from the 7th and the uh, P source is from the 5th, J and E are the earliest traditions. And what happens is Southern Kingdom, Northern Kingdom. After the Northern Kingdom falls in around 721, the J and the E source are woven together to produce the JE. And therefore you will have double narratives. One from J and one from E. That's how Abraham ends up passing his wife off as his sister three times. <laughs> it doesn't happen three times, they're three different sources. Okay, but there's a J and an E in that particular one. So the traditions then about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that we're going to talk about in a few minutes are grouped into cycles. So you have the Abraham cycle, the Isaac cycle, and the Jacob cycle. And that produces the epic of the ancestors, the stories of the patriarchs. Our patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then there's a link to the stories of Sinai and the conquest. And that produces then the epic history of Israel that's developing. And so, uh, you know, you have a number of things. So the Sinai, and again, if you look at things, there are Sinai narratives and there are Exodus narratives, and they come from different sources. And the Exodus narratives don't necessarily have a Sinai in them. And the conquest, say so Exodus and conquest, Exodus and wandering will go together, but not Sinai. The Sinai narratives are coming from a different source. And so, you know, you can say, well, as far as these people are concerned, they never, they never experienced Sinai. <laughs> you know? So, the, as, as you uh, may have been read or will read in both, most scholars today would say that all Israelites did not experience the Exodus or did not experience Sinai. Some experienced the Exodus, some experienced Sinai, but it isn't until they were settled in the land at the time of Joshua that they all come together and become a nation. At that covenant renewal ceremony at the end of the book of Joshua, in Joshua 24. That's the point at which everybody comes together and moves forward. There have been various different groups and different things happening with the people. And even some were still in the land. And so you have those in the land, those who experience the exodus, those who experience the wandering, etc., all coming together and saying, we worship this one God, Yahweh. There is your nation. And there, as I will say later on, is the completion of the promises to Abraham. It takes up to that point. Okay? If I'm jumping too far ahead, uh, stop me, because I... And I'm trying to go forward a little bit with things. Okay, now, does that help you with your JEDP? Okay. Anyone else need help with their JEDP? <laughs> okay. Now, the world of the patriarchs, the Middle East. You'll notice that green is sort of the kind of inhabitable lands and areas. 
and you'll notice the green kind of goes like this. And that's what we refer to as the fertile crescent. There's brown here. That's what we refer to as desert. <laughs> Actually, the Arabian desert and various other deserts. And so, very little settlements here. Lots of oil little settlements. Okay. This area here is what we would call modern-day Iraq. This area here is what we would call modern-day Iran. This area here would be modern-day Syria. This area here would be modern-day Lebanon. And this area here would be modern-day Turkey. This area here would be modern-day Israel. This is modern-day Egypt. This is modern-day Jordan. Okay, that's, that's kind of how it, how it operates. Abraham starts out here. This is the town of Ur, Ur of the Chaldees. And he's called to go to a land that God will show him. And so he comes up to a place called Haran, up at the top. And this is where we have situations with Lot and various other people. And then he continues down to here, to the promised land. And this is the land that's given to Abraham. Okay? And so that's why this whole area here is called the uh, world of the patriarchs, because we have things going on. But notice, when you travel, you travel this way. You don't travel this way because you wouldn't make it <laughs> for all practical purposes. You would not make it in terms of things. Then, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. There is a famine, and Jacob and his sons migrate to here, to Egypt. And that's where we have then the exodus, where we come back. This is the Sinai Peninsula here. Now, of course, there's a question, you know, what, does Mo, what do many texts say that they cross? They cross the Red Sea. Well, there's the Red Sea. They cross the Red Sea to Sinai. Well, no, you cross the Red Sea to Arabia. It's actually in Hebrew, Yam Suf, which is the Sea of Reeds which is considered to be a much smaller body of water. And in a certain sense, you have the Gulf of Suez here on one side of the Sinai Peninsula and the Gulf of Aqaba here on the other side of the Sinai Peninsula. And even, so more than likely, the place where they crossed was up here. Which also makes sense. If you follow the Red Sea theory, they're here. Which means they've got to travel all the way down here cross the Red Sea, come up here, travel here, then that's quite a circuitous route. Whereas if you came this way, you're in, you're in proper shape. Now, the question that occurs today is where is Mount Sinai? Some say there, some say there, and some say there. Actually, St. Catherine's Monastery is located around here. So what, what tradition, when you go and do a pilgrimage to Mount Sinai, you go to this region here, as, as we did. I, uh, I and a camel had a bad experience, so I never made it to the top of Mount Sinai. <laughs> my, my compatriot referred to it as dromedary air. <laughs> but uh, the, the rest of the students, the faculty, did make it to the top of Mount Sinai. I never did and probably never will. But anyway, uh, that's where St. Catherine's Monastery is there. So, the events that take place in all of the material that you read in the first parts of the, of the Bible, in the first six books or seven books, occur here. Okay? Okay, now let's talk a little bit about covenants. The Anchor Bible Dictionary, page 1179, defines a covenant as an agreement enacted between two parties in which one or both make promises under oath to perform or refrain from certain actions stipulated in advance. Two or one or both, excuse me, between two parties, one or both. 
if one is involved, it's a unilateral covenant. If both are involved, it's a bilateral covenant. Our covenants are of both varieties. So a unilateral covenant then would have one party involved and a bilateral covenant would have both parties involved. Just to make a long story short, the covenant with Abraham is unilateral. The covenant with Moses is bilateral. The covenant with David is unilateral. You can see how the covenant with David would then fight with the covenant with Moses. Oh, we don't have to do anything. See, unilateral means God is going to ask. In the unilateral covenant, it's God who asks. The people don't have to do anything. So basically, God says to Abraham, you know, go, I will give you this land. Okay, fine. Abraham doesn't have to do a thing. He has to go, but he hasn't done that A bilateral covenant says, I will be your God if you will be my people. The people have to do something. And so, you know, David, you know, your kingdom will last forever. You don't have to do a thing. Bilateral, I will be your God if you will be my people. God said to David, the kingdom will last forever. We don't have to do, we can do whatever we want. Jeremiah, don't do what God wants and you're going to be punished. We can do whatever we want. You see how the unilateral and the bilateral fight? You know, in there. That's, that's what's going on. Okay, now the major biblical covenants are the covenant with Noah. Where did he come from? <laughs> That's my, uh, the Genesis text and Noah are my nods to chapter 6, <laughs> the prehistory. The covenant with Noah is that God will never destroy the world by water again. And God's sign that he will never destroy the world by water again is the rainbow. Okay. The covenant with Abraham. I will give you the land, I will make you a great nation, I will give you progeny, etc. You don't have to do anything. The covenant with Moses, I will be your God if you will be my people. It's bilateral. The covenant with David, your kingdom will last forever, so also will the temple, so will the, uh, the city of Jerusalem, etc. Be, be eternal. You don't have to do anything. And finally, the New Testament, the covenant in Christ, where Christ dies for us to free us and sheds his blood for us, etc. And all of that connects in, the covenant with Christ connects in with all of the above, in a certain sense. So those are what we're dealing with. So now, the covenant with Noah is in a period of prehistory. Chapter 6 basically talks about prehistory. Why do we say prehistory? You can't date what's going on in Genesis 1 to 11. You, know, you can't tell me the date of creation, although there are people who think they can. You, know, you can't tell me the date of Noah, you know, as far as things go. So uh, it's prehistory, and the covenant is basically that God will not destroy the earth by flood again. And the rainbow in the sky is the sign of that covenant with Noah. And uh, so, so it has been kept together, etc. Okay, that, that's uh, prehistory again. Just the other thing to talk about is prehistory in Genesis 11 ends with the Tower of Babel. And the Tower of Babel is actually an attempt of the people to uh, more or less make their way to God. Well, God doesn't want them to make their way to Him by building a tower. And so what does He do? He confuses their languages. Okay. So that becomes then a sort of an etiological myth of why there are so many different languages around. Because they were presumptuous and trying to get to heaven and God confused the languages. Anyone know what the opposite of Babel is? No. Pentecost, excellent, why? The many languages became one. Now, Pentecost is the opposite of Babel. Yeah. In terms of language, etc. Okay? So there, there's another. So any other, any other questions or any thoughts or observations, those of you who have uh, read it, of, on chapter 6? I think that was the prehistory chapter. Not prehistoric. <laughs> Because I, I want to make sure I cover whatever you may want, you, you may ask. 
Uh, also, there are there are things. That he, what um, Bolt does mention is the Enuma Elish and Gilgamesh. Those are two things. The Enuma Elish is a Babylonian creation epic about Marduk and Tiamat, and the Gilgamesh epic is a Babylonian uh, flood epic about uh, a guy by the name of Gilgamesh who uh, gets caught into a worldwide flood, etc. So you'll, you'll hear a few things about that. And then the question that I put up about uh, from chapter 6 is a question about myth. And again, that's another, it's a word that is misinterpreted, if I may say so. <laughs> when we say myth, the implication is not true. You know, it's, yeah, it's sort of mythical, etc. When the Old Testament uses myth, it uses it in terms of a story that has a religious power to it. And so it has effect to move and to uh, affect lives of people, etc. And that's what I think is rather important, you know, in terms of it becomes a model. And I use the term etiological before. Itia is a cause. And so an etiological myth is a story that gives causes for something. So the etiology of multiple languages would be seen in the story of the Tower of Babel. So it would be a myth about it. Well, it, it explains the causes of things, basically. In ancient time, time was expressed, in ancient thought, such time was expressed by means of certain traditional themes or motifs that were different from everyday language and experience. This type of literature is known everywhere as myth. Myths are not all of one kind, nor they only, do they only speak of creation. They also tell stories of gods, legendary heroes, etc., of the origins of customs, of ethnic groups, etc. In many cases, myth is tied closely to ritual in worship and forms the dramatic explanation for actual celebration. And so you celebrate something that has happened in the context of your religious life in a liturgical celebration. That the story of the something that happened is myth, the liturgical celebration would be liturgy, would be ritual. And so myth is connected up with ritual also, but it in no way, shape, or form implies the fact that it never happened or it's false. Today, when you say, oh, it's mythical, well, that means some sort of fancy fairy tale with uh, you know these little critters bouncing around and things of that sort. No, no. To an ancient myth is very real. It's a very, very real thing. It's not not something fanciful at all. And so myth would become theological. And we have to be very careful when we use that term because many times people will interpret it today in a today meeting. And that's not the case. Marcia Aliadi from the University of Chicago was very much into myth and ritual. He has a number of books out on the whole notion of myth and ritual as it occurred in the ancient world. And so that, that would give you further information as to what's going on. The vote is a very good explanation at the end of chapter 6. Anything else? Okay, well then let's go to historical material now. Abraham becomes somebody who we can actually put a historical tag on. Okay? Abraham lived probably around 1800 B.C. Uh, why, do I say, why do I say that? It basically ties together. Some people will like to date him as far back as 2200 B.C., Others will date him around 2000 BC, so sometime between 800 and so. You know, when you're talking 18, uh, well, what was it? when you're talking approximately, uh, what is it, uh, 20, 3800 years ago? What's 4000 years one way or the other? <laughs> In the course of things. Uh, but I like to date him around 1800 because then it gives a pretty good dating for the rest of what's going on. Where you put Abraham determines where you put everything else. Now, 
this is this may not mean anything to you, but one of the experiences I had was uh, in the town of Jericho in uh, Israel. There is an archaeological dig by an, a British archaeologist by the name of Kathleen Kenyon it's called Neolithic Jericho. And it dates from approximately 33, 3400 BCE. And uh, I find it rather interesting that 33, 3400, or 3500 is 2500, almost 1800 years before Abraham. And we say Abraham is 1800 BC. And I stand there and say, this building, or these buildings, are as far before Abraham as we are almost after him. I'm sorry, it's 8,000 no, it's it's 8, it's 8, B.C., that's what it is. And this building is as far before Abraham as we are after him. And you just sit there and just wallow. You know? And you look at that and then say, well, okay, the world was created in seven days. If you calculate things, then it was sometime in 20... No, that can't be. The seven days have to be a mythical seven days and not an actual, and I think most, most uh, Catholic scholars anyway would go along with that as far as things are. So you put Abraham around 1800 BCE. Okay, now, what do we have? So Genesis 15 and 17. Well, actually, I'm going to go through a couple of texts. Let's, uh, let's look at Genesis 12. This is an important one. It's the call of Abraham. The Lord said to Abram, actually in the beginning of the Abraham text, he's known as Abram. More on that in a minute. Go forth. Lake Laka in Hebrew. Halak in Hebrew means to walk. Lake Laka almost means take a little walk for yourself. Okay? Go and walk. Go forth from the land of your kinsfolk. From your father's house. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, yes. From the land of your kinsfolk and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. So go from the land to a land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless you, bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And all the communities of the earth shall find blessing in you. There is a promise. So Abraham is to go. And of course, as I pointed out, the land of, the land of his generations in his father's house it was Ur the Chaldees. And the land is on the other side of the crescent, the land of Israel. And so notice, the first thing we hear with Abraham is leave your land to get a land. The land becomes very significant. Okay, so Abraham then went as the Lord directed. Okay, that's that's Genesis 12. Okay, then we have several stories. Uh, 14 is Sodom and Gomorrah. 15 then is where we're at on the slide. So Genesis 15 and Genesis 17. Genesis 15 is basically uh, a J.E. account of the covenant with Abraham. Genesis 17 is a P. account of the covenant with Abraham. And so, looking at the slide and then the text, Genesis 15 and 17, several promises are made. The promise of descendants in Genesis 15. The promise of the land in Genesis 15 and 17. Given to the descendants of Abraham from the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates as an everlasting possession. Okay. Now let's look at the uh, let's look at the text and see what, what happens here. Let me go to the next one and then I'll put that together. And then 17, he will become a great nation, and he will become a nation. Okay, Genesis 15 is unilateral. God will give the land to Abraham, sealed by a burning torch passing between the animals. So look at Genesis 15 now. 
sometime after these events, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. I will make your reward very great. Abraham said, O Lord God, what good will be your gifts if I keep on being childless and have as my heir the steward of my house, Eliezer? Okay, so... Abraham's going to be the father of a great nation, he's going to have great descendants, he's going to have this land, except he's got a problem. He ain't got no kids. And he's getting old and his wife is getting old. Okay, so what's the, what's the procedure? Okay, well, I'll adopt. I'll adopt a servant. So I'll have as my heir the steward of my house, Eliezer. That's the solution. What does God say? Uh-uh. Not, not, not good. So Abram continued, See, you have given me no offspring, so that no, so that no one of my servants will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came and said, No, that shall not be your, uh, no, no, that one shall not be your heir, Eliezer. Your own issue shall be your heir. So you're going to have a son. He took him outside and said, look up to the sky and count to the stars if you, can, if you can. Just so, he added, shall your descendants be. That many, eh? Abram put his faith in the Lord who credited to him as an act of righteousness. There you see the characteristic of Abraham. Faith. Abraham is our father in faith. St. Paul is going to build on Abraham's faith. St. Paul will take Genesis 15, 6. You know, that's a righteousness. That's a big Pauline word. Okay? So now, Abram says, okay, I believe you, God. Then, you know, we have the covenant ceremony. Bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old she-goat, a three-year-old ram, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought them and split them in two and placed the half opposite to each other, but the birds he did not cut up. Birds of prey swooped down upon the carcasses, but Abraham stayed with them, and the sun was about to set. A trance fell upon Abraham, and a deep and terrifying darkness enveloped him. Now, this is quite a bloody mess we have here. <laughs> but again, with ratification of covenant, blood becomes very important. And the cutting up of the animals is basically an implicit saying, if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, then may this happen to me. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants shall be aliens in a land not their own, reference to Egypt, where they shall be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. But I will bring judgment on the nation they must serve, and in the end they will depart with great wealth. You, however, shall join your forefathers in peace. You shall be buried at a contented old age. In the fourth time span, others shall come back here. The wickedness of the Amorites will not have reached full measure until then. So there's a prophecy of the migration into Egypt and ultimately the Exodus. When the sun had set and it was dark, there appeared a smoking brazier and a flaming torch which passed between the two pieces. It was on that occasion that the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I will give this land. From the Wadi of Egypt to the great river, the Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Kazmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, and the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. If there are any more ites around, them too. Okay. It's a promise of blood. Notice, only God passes through. Abram does not. You need lateral covenant binding on God. What's God going to do? Give the land. What does Abraham have to do? Nothing. So Abraham is now set. My descendant. Wife is getting too old to bear children, so we'll try another method. Sarah gives one of her slave girls, Hagar, to Abram, through whom he has a child, Ishmael. Ishmael, the Lord heard. And so now he figures, okay, here's my descendant who's going to get all of these things. God says, uh-uh. 
That doesn't work either. Not Eleazar, not Ishmael. Sarah will have a child, and that's in Genesis 18, where the three visitors come and say, a year from now you'll be bouncing a son upon your lap. And Sarah hears this, and Yitzhak, she laughs. Ta'ak in Hebrew means to laugh. Yitzhak means she laughed. And her response names the son. Isaac means she laughed. But, that's what exactly happened. She conceived, she bears a son, and Isaac is born. So we now have two sons. Isaac of Sarah and Ishmael of Hagar. Let's look at Genesis 17 and then go back to the two sons. Genesis 17 is again giving the land to Abraham and his descendants. But in Genesis 17, Avram, Av in Hebrew means father, Ra in Hebrew means great, so Avram is the great or the high father, and for that reason, because of his name, many think of him as a tribal chieftain. His name is changed to Avraham. Av, father, Ra, great, Am, people, nation. So the great high father, Avram, becomes the father of a great nation, Avraham. And the sign of this giving of the land and this father of a great nation is the sign of circumcision, whereby the firstborn of children, and again, this becomes an etiological myth. Obviously, circumcision is something necessary for health reasons, but there's an etiological, theological explanation given connecting it up with the covenant, that you become a member of the covenanted people of Israel through this ritual of circumcision. But the name change, you know, the name change is a sign of a change of, of change of life, a change of job, a change of position, etc. We will have several name changes in the Old Testament. You know, Yaakov, the one who steals, becomes, becomes Yisrael, the one who saw God and lived. You know, so Jacob becomes Israel. Uh, Kepha becomes Peter. Saul becomes Paul. You know, there's a whole, and it all is interconnected with a change of way of life. And so the name change of Abram to Abraham basically designates his position in terms of things. Okay. So, back to Abraham's two sons. And this brings us, some would go along with this, some would not go along with this. But basically, Abraham and Paul is going to make a big... See, this is where the Old Testament is important. If you're going to read Galatians 3, you have to know what's going on here. Because Paul makes a whole typology of Abraham, Hagar, Ishmael, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac. Of the one bound by the law, the slave girl, Hagar, the one who was free from the law, the wife, Sarah, the son of the slave girl, Ishmael, the son of the free one, Isaac. If you don't know what's going on in Genesis 16, 17, and 18 here, you'll never understand what's going on with Paul in Galatians 3. So see, that, that, that's why it's, it's necessary to study this stuff and know what it is. But also, Ishmael, Ishmael, is seen to be the father of the Arab race. Isaac is the father of the Jewish race. Both are descendants of Abraham. The land is promised to Abraham and his descendants. Do you see a problem? Yes. There is your roots of the Middle Eastern crap. Still, today, yes. See, that's where the land comes down into the current situation. 
unfortunately, I couldn't get it to work. There is, uh, and I don't know how it would work going through here and whatnot, but how many of you are familiar with The West Wing? You know, the, the television series that ended about three or four years ago. Okay, uh, in 2001, shortly after 9-11, The West Wing basically did not come back on the air with its continuing series at that point. But rather, between the time of September 11th and the day it came back, it created a new episode that was not, con not conceived. And the title of the episode was Isaac and Ishmael. If you ever get a chance to see it, it's, it's really interesting. And basically, it was, the, the story of it was, there was a group of high school kids getting a trip tour through the White House, and there was a lockdown call. And so they ushered them down to the cafeteria, and that allows the various characters of the West Wing to interact with the high school students while in the background they're searching for this Arab uh, person who's infiltrated the White House. And, of course, there is a gentleman who's been very, very loyal to the president and everything else that was an Arab name that Leo was interrogating and what have you. And, well, in that side of it, it turns out they had the wrong man, but he had the same name as a terrorist in Germany, and the terrorist in Germany is the one that they were looking for, not the one in the White House. And once they figured that out, the lockdown was lifted, and there was now the dealing with this gentleman in the White House who had given, almost given his life to the preceding president, who is now being considered a terrorist, so that's a sideline. But anyway, Sam and, uh, and uh, Josh and all the various people are down there talking about what's a terrorist with these high school kids and so on and so forth. Abigail comes down. And the scene with her is magnificent because she begins, Abraham had two sons. And it goes right back to this section of Genesis. And you have to, again, know what's going on in Genesis about how, you know, Isaac was the ancestor of the Jewish race and Ishmael the ancestor of the Arab race and the land was given to both of them. And yet, this enmity between them as Ishmael being thrown out of the house and everything else, yet it ends by saying, two sons came together to bury their father. It's a beautiful scene. And, and I did excerpt it off of a CD, but I just have never been able to play it again as far as things go. But it, it, it really does, you know, lay into what's going on. And all of a sudden, there's a way that this Old Testament stuff that's so ancient history, no, it's very much alive in the Holy Land today, you know, in terms of things. And again, what is it a fight over? The land. And so as you read... You know, as you read both and as you read texts of the Old Testament, pay attention to how that theme, that theme of the land goes through, you know, goes through the whole thing, you know, rather interestingly. Okay, any other, any other questions or comments? Okay, well, uh, I was going to stop at 11. It's now 11.15, and you wanted a shorter break, so uh, why don't we go break until 11.30? I think I'm talking too much. <laughs>